There are endless good causes asking for our donations, the church included. But what if our finances could actually be a powerful way to encounter our faith? Uh, so this morning, we're going to be kicking off just a, a new series, just a three-week-long series, and we're calling it Nickeled and Dimed. We're going to be talking about money. Who's excited? Yeah, I love that. Um, what we wanted to do in this series is we wanted to spend a few weeks d- digging into the scriptures to discern what in the world does God have to say concerning our money and our wealth and our possessions and all that external stuff that we have in our lives. Now, frankly, um, here at TFRC, we don't talk about this topic very often. Um, and I realize that there are some or perhaps many of us in this room that the topic of money comes up in a church and we're not exactly thrilled to hear about it, right? Um, the good news is Pastor Chuck and I are not exactly chomping at the bit to talk about money with you either. So we're all in the same boat together. We're going to be okay. I promise. Um, one of my roles here at TFRC um, has been to do all the premarital counseling for the church. And I get to just meet with many, many, many couples to talk through um, marriage and what it's going to be like and all the questions and personality and all that kind of stuff and all the faith stuff as well. Um, And one of the things that I do when I sit down with couples for premarital counseling is I always share the top three things that seem to lead to divorce, at least in America. Um, The three big things that lead to divorce, the first one is familiar to most of us, right? It'd be um, communication breakdown or conflict management issues, right? Like couples that can't seem to communicate well or deal with conflict well, they generally don't make it. The second is sex. We'll move on past that one. Um, And then there's the last one, money money. Countless marriages end every single year because of money, because of debt and bills and financial issues and all of that stuff. Lots of marriages end because of money. And you see, the reality is that countless followers of Jesus don't just divorce their spouses over money. They divorce their churches over money as well. You see, we don't like it when the church pressures us to give, and we don't like it when the church wants to talk about what's in our wallets, right? It's something we just don't like to talk about. And for many folks, when this topic comes up, they're like, dude, I'm out of here. We're not hearing that this morning. But here's the deal, folks. Whether we want to talk about money or not, our relationship to money is incredibly important to our faith. It's incredibly important. Um, The Bible mentions money over 800 times, over 800 times. And if we never talked about money and finances around here, well, frankly, TFRC, we wouldn't be able to call ourselves a Bible church because we simply wouldn't take the Bible all that seriously. So why in the world does the Bible talk about money so often? Um, You see, our relationship with money, so the scriptures say, often reveals our hearts. You see? For whatever reason, money gets to our hearts quickly. And so finances speak volumes about our faith. Um, Jesus, in the Gospels, in his ministry, when he would go off and minister and teach and use parables and all that stuff, 15% of the time, he was either talking about money or he was using money as a sort of illustration to get his point across. And why would Jesus do that? Well, Jesus did so because he knew that money gets at our hearts quickly. You see? And so in this series, what we wanted to do is talk about the relationship between finances and our faith, because our finances inform our faith on all kinds of levels. And so uh, to kick off our series this morning, we wanted to um, listen to Jesus preach before we listen to me preach, I guess. Um, We're going to turn to the Sermon on the Mount. Um, If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open up to Matthew 6. Verses 19 through 25, we're going to be reading there this morning. That's page 787 in uh, the Worship Center Bibles. And our scripture reader this morning is Alicia Cervantes. Alicia, wherever you are, you can head on up to read for us. And folks, what we do here, we do it every week. We stand, we face the center of the room for the reading of God's word because this book matters to us this much that we would stand for it. So Alicia, when you're ready, you can take it away. 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your, your body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Thank you, Alicia. You all may take a seat. Go ahead and leave your Bibles open there. We're going to be uh, spending a lot of time there this morning. Um, we love control over our lives, right? Um, we love to make our own decisions. Um, we love to carve out our own destinies in life. Um, we love the idea of being free, personally free in our lives. And yet there's also another stark reality. See, while we love control over our lives, there is this other reality that says we don't actually have as much control over our lives than we are comfortable with. There are literally a million things that could happen to us right now that we would be powerless to control in our lives. There could be big things like earthquakes or famines or tornadoes or Yellowstone could finally, you know, that could happen. Um, there could be debilitating illnesses in our lives. Something bad could happen to our kids. We could lose our job. Um, despite doing everything right, we could still lose it. We love control over our lives, yet there's this reality that we don't have as much control as we are comfortable with. Um, I had a reminder of this this week. Um, I was on the flight from Twin Falls to Salt Lake City this last week. Anyone been on that flight before? I love how people start laughing when I ask that. <laughs> um, on that flight, we're flying, and then we make it to Salt Lake City area, and we start descending. And then I look down and everything is covered in white, which is whatever. We get closer to the ground and I realize that there is a significant amount of snow on the ground in Salt Lake City, more than I have at least ever seen since I've lived here. And then as we get closer to the runway, I look down and I notice that the runway is covered in snow. Like there's this much pavement between, you know, on each side, there's this pavement and then snow. And I realize that the plane that I am currently in that is descending is going to land and it's not landing on that two inches of pavement. It's landing on the snow. And then I think to myself, this plane is going like 500 miles an hour or something like that. And it's supposed to stop on that snow. You see? At this point, I start freaking out just a little bit. Like, what happens, right? Um, what happens if the plane slides off the runway and then crashes? That would be bad. Like, what happens if the plane suddenly needs to stop because there's like another plane or something like that, and then we smack into that plane? What happens if I die? I have so much more left to live for, you know? Like, I don't know if you've had this experience in a plane before. And it was at that moment I realized how little control over the situation I had. I was sitting in a seat and there was nothing that I could do that could alter what would possibly happen with this plane in this snowy runway. And then the plane rolls in and the plane lands and this is gonna blow your minds. I survived. <laughs> I know, it was crazy. Surprisingly, pilots know what they're doing when they fly planes. I don't know, that was news to me. You see, we have these moments all the time in our lives where we simply have no control over our lives. Now, what in the world does all of that have to do with money? Well, actually, it has a lot to do with money. See, one of the primary things that we tend to hold on to, to grab onto in our lives, to gain control over our lives is, well, it's money. So often in our lives, we reach for our wealth or our possessions or our property to gain a feeling of control over our lives. And you see, it is this that Jesus wants us to notice in our scripture reading this morning. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'd open back up to our scripture reading. It's Matthew 6, starting in verse uh, 19. Um, I want to show you a couple things in here. See, what Jesus is doing 
is he's illustrating for us what the nature of money and wealth in our lives actually is. And Jesus uses these three comparisons to make his point. I want you to see these. Um, take a look in verse 19 a second. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. And then in verse 20, But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. There is this dichotomy between storing up treasures on earth and storing up treasures in heaven. Storing treasures on earth versus storing treasures in heaven. And then Jesus gives us another image. If you have your Bible, take a look at verse 22 a second. Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. And then he talks about what your eyes are like and how your eyes are actually, it's a way to look inside of our souls in some sense, Jesus says. Is there light in there? Is there darkness in there? And he says, well, it depends on if you have healthy eyes or you have unhealthy eyes. Healthy eyes versus unhealthy eyes. And the decisions we choose in our lives will affect what's inside of us. Healthy eyes, light, dark, or uh, 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 unhealthy eyes, darkness. And then in verse 24, I think Jesus uses perhaps his clearest teaching on money in, in all of the Bible. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 24. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We can either serve God or we can serve money. Serving God versus serving money. It's that other dichotomy. And it's our choice. Storing up treasure on earth versus storing up treasure in heaven. Healthy eyes versus unhealthy eyes. Serving God versus serving money. Now when we really pay attention here to what Jesus is saying, he's illustrating an important point about finances and faith. And the point is this, that it's binary, the choice is. We only get to pick one, you see? There is no all the above answer where we get to pick and choose as we like to here. Jesus says, no, there's no way we can serve both money and God at the same time we have to pick. You see? In fact, in the scriptures, Jesus has this interesting encounter with, with a rich young ruler, a rich man in the Gospel of Matthew, and it illustrates this so well what he's talking about here. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. That's page 800 in the Bibles in here. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. Listen to this story of Jesus a second. It says, just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Listen to this. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Why? did the rich man walk away sad? You see, it's because Jesus said, you have to pick faith or your finances. You can't pick both, Jesus says. And because this rich young ruler, because he couldn't have it both ways, he picked the one he couldn't bear to be without the most. That was his money, you see? And just like the rich young ruler, we all have to pick two. We all do. See, here's the thing about money. Money promises a lot of things for our lives, right? Um, money promises us control over our lives. And money promises us 
freedom in our lives. And money promises us a future for our lives. But you see, control and freedom and a future, those are not things that money's actually going to be able to get us in the long term of things. Those are only things God can give us. See, money has the propensity to take the place of God in our lives, and it does so so easily. And Jesus says again and again and again to pay close attention to this in our lives. Watch our lives closely because money can become our God and we might not even notice it, Jesus says. What does that look like if money has become our God? Look, if you find yourself feeling like you never have enough money, right? Well, money might be your God. Um, If you have a chronic fear, whether it's good in life or bad in life, that there might not be enough, that the money might run dry, money may have become our God then. If we really struggle to part ways with our cold um, earned cash, right? Well, if you struggle to part with your money, money may have become our God. If we find that we're unwilling to do really normal things in life and we use money as the excuse for that, even though there's money in the bank, well, I'd be willing to bet that money has become our God then. If we feel like money has the most control over our lives most of the time in our lives, well, money may have become our God. If losing money is one of the great fears in our lives. Like if we lost it all, that would be a really, really bad day. Like top two. Well, money may have become a God in our lives. See, the question is, really, who are we serving? You're serving something. Who are we serving? Are we really serving God? Or are we serving money at the end of the day? To put it another way, who or what do we trust in most in our lives? Could we honestly say, yes, it's God that I trust and I place all my trust in God? Or or would we say, well, maybe money inches God out there. I really trust my dollars and cents. And folks, this is one of the areas in our lives where we are particularly good at deceiving ourselves, aren't we? Like, oh yeah, no, no, I'm a Christian. Like, I believe in God. God is number one in my life and my list of things that I have of, you know, top 10 list. Um, But then reality on the ground might look different and it might be an uncomfortable reality for some of us, right? We're really good at tricking ourselves about money, aren't we? You see, at the end of the day, money will never give us what we think it will. It never will. Money will never give us an everlasting hope, Money will never make us into the people that we imagine that we should be in life. Money will never make people like you and me. I know it's surprising. It won't. In fact, it often does the opposite in our lives. Jesus says, we all have to choose. Jesus says, are you going to pick me or are you going to pick your money? Now, perhaps this morning you're feeling like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe money is a God for me. Maybe it is. Um, what do you, like, what do you do about that, right? You see, what Jesus illustrates with the rich young ruler is a really simple truth, I think. Jesus says, the only cure to being controlled by the coin is you have to give it away. You have to give it away. If you don't want money to be your God, you've got to give it away. Actually, that's a really simple truth. You just got to give it away. Money loses its power over us when we intentionally lose it, you see? (laughs) It's amazing. You know, for me personally, this has been one of my hardest life lessons. Um, 
when I was a kid, I grew up very poor. Um, I grew up in a 1960s, 70s single wide trailer. It was rusty. And when it would rain, I remember my dad would have to jump on the roof and try to plug the holes where it was leaking, right? It was one of those great houses. And money was this anxiety in our house growing up all the time. Would there be enough to pay the bills this month? We didn't always have the answer to that question. It was a really big fear for us. Um, would, would we have enough for groceries this week? We didn't know. We didn't always know. Would we have enough to get the new clothes we need or the shoes we need? Sometimes we didn't know. There was an anxiety around that. And then I grew up and I became an adult and I brought all that anxiety about money with me into my life and my marriage and my family. I was fearful of money for like a lot of my life. I remember there were times when Becca and I would have to make a big purchase and I could not get myself to slide my debit card on the debit card thing. I just couldn't do it. So I had Becca do it. <laughs> we share a bank account, so I don't know what the purpose of that was, right? And do you know what changed me? Do you know what changed the anxiety around money? We came to a place where we felt like God was really saying, you know what, you have some work to do here, John. And so we felt like God said, you need to start giving some of your money away. And so we chose to start giving just little bits of our money away to um, intentional like nonprofits that we trusted, nonprofits that were about Jesus, you know, that kind of stuff. And we started giving our money away more open-handedly to folks that were in need that we ran into in our lives. And we started giving money to missionaries. And we started tithing to the church. And you wouldn't believe, folks, what that does. The act of just handing our money over removes its power. It changes us. It no longer allows money to be our God's. It's amazing. What about you? Who do you really serve? Can you say it was, it, it, can you say it's God? Or is it money? See, Jesus says we have to choose. What are you choosing these days? What's God calling you to these days? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you've given us your word. Um, and your word is filled with all kinds of beauty, but also practicality as well, God, that you even talk to us about money. God, we ask that each of us in this room, um, you give us a spirit that can look honestly at ourselves. How do we treat our finances? Do we pick our finances over you? Can you show us how maybe that's not going to work for us, God? God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you are so gracious to us on topics like these and every other topic. And we thank you that um, even where we're at this morning, talking about money, that you still go to a cross for us because you love us and you're gracious to us. So God, we ask that you send your spirit to change us, if that's what needs to happen this morning, to grow us more into the image of Jesus. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord raise his countenance to you and give you peace. Amen, church?